Well, good Friday morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Pasqua, Community Relations Lead with Spectrum Health, and we welcome you to what we believe is going to be a rich and timely conversation, a morning chat with Dr. Bragg. Dr. Bragg, how are you this morning? I'm very good. Good to be here with you, Jennifer. Absolutely. If you could, could you just introduce yourself, give us a little bit of your background, just so everyone who is tuning in right now can get an idea of what expertise you're bringing to the table this morning? Absolutely. So my name is Dr. Talanda Bragg. I'm an internal medicine hospitalist. That means I take care of adults when they're uh, sick and need to be admitted to the hospital. I also help train the next generation of internal medicine docs. I am the program director for the Spectrum Health Internal Medicine Residency Program. I've been with Spectrum Health now um, for 11 years uh, as an attending physician, but I did medical school, uh, my clinical rotations with Spectrum Health years ago, and I also did residency here myself. Uh, so uh, I am a transplant, but I absolutely love the West Michigan community. So you guys are probably stuck with me. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, and we're happy to be. Uh, let's let's talk about a variety of things. You know, um, before we get into the conversation, though, I want to remind people who are jumping on and tuning in as you're thumb stopping and watching this conversation. Once this live stream has been completed, what will happen is that it will remain on the social platform that you're watching us on right now. So you can go back, rewind. If there's something that uh, you didn't quite grasp the first time around, we encourage you to. Make sure to go back and re-listen, re-watch, and also share with your own circle because this is a conversation that many of us believe is, again, very timely and something that's very important and crucial. So let's get right into it. So uh, in case you missed it, last night there was a wonderful conversation. Spectrum Health was a proud sponsor of an online conversation hosted by Grand Rapids African American Health Institute, Grahai. The topic, the color of COVID, a candid discussion about an illness that is killing us. And that illness, of course, being COVID-19. Dr. Bragg, you were one of the panelists in that conversation. And the first thing that really stuck out to me are three points that you felt the black and brown communities really need to embrace as we begin to continue to understand this pandemic and COVID and the vaccines that follow. Yeah, so really, I think it was really important to emphasize um, transparency, uh, not only with the development of the vaccine, uh, what uh, possible side effects are, who it's available to, any information possible. Uh, I also uh, feel that people are empowered by knowledge and we can't expect people to make the best informed decisions for themselves unless we equip them with all of the tools. I, I really think that's how we started to get ahead of um, the exceptionally high COVID rates in the black and brown communities with outreach and getting the word out there. There were so many grassroots efforts, um, especially here in uh, Kent County uh, through all of our healthcare departments, not just Spectrum Health, but um, you know, you saw stuff coming out from Mercy Health and Metro, and we all really partnered along with the health department to really get the message out about COVID-19. So this is kind of more of the same, in my opinion. This is a continuation so that we can make sure that everybody has the proper access to life-saving information so all of us can be well. Well, and given your background, you have seen much more than the typical community member. So if we could, let's dive into the behind the scenes in terms of, you know, when this started back in March, now where we're at right now, what you have seen within the walls of Spectrum Health. Yeah. So this is uh, interesting to me because although I live here, uh, my husband and I, both of our families are still on the southeast side of Michigan uh, in the metro Detroit area. I grew up in Inkster still. My parents are there, uh, lots of family and friends. So um, as we know, COVID-19 hit metro uh, Detroit and southeast Michigan so hard. Um, it came fast and furious. We didn't have the warning. We didn't have the benefit of education. And there was no benefit of planning. All of a sudden, you had these thousands of patients overwhelming the healthcare system, in addition to the normal stuff that we were seeing. Um, so for me, I felt somewhat detached. You know, I was here in West Michigan. People were still denying that COVID even was a thing. Uh, we hadn't had any cases. And I 
and my husband, we had several family members, several friends that were fighting for their lives even um, before we had our first case walk through Spectrum doors. Um, I I probably knew at least 30 people, I uh, knew of 30 people that had COVID-19, uh, some being very close. My, my husband, both his grandparents passed away from COVID-19. Uh, my brother and sister-in-law were, were critically ill from COVID-19. Sister-in-law spent 16 days on a ventilator, uh, now is doing well, thank God. Uh, but um, we saw how bad um, as a family this can get. So as time progressed and uh, we did the stay home stay safe, we kind of got control or better control of things. We even saw the percent positives go down, meaning of all the people getting tested for COVID-19, uh, very few were testing positive. Um, about 3% was the, the best that we were doing um, at one point. And then as time progressed, we got a little lax. Um, we started uh, integrating back, um, you know, doing things. Uh, some people were not as vigilant with the things that we know that can stop the spread or prevent the spread, like wearing masks, social distancing, keeping six feet, uh, frequent hand washing, those type of things. And we saw our numbers climb uh, significantly to the point where it definitely had reached our West Michigan borders. Uh, in, the, in our hospitals in October and November, it was at its worst. Uh, that percent positive got as high as uh, 20%. Uh, so COVID-19, we know now has infiltrated our community uh, here in West Michigan. So all those things that we did earlier to slow down a disease, we definitely uh, had to slow uh, continue doing those things again. Um, it was concerning now with it being the holidays and COVID-19 has caused us all to readjust in so many different uh, aspects of our life. And one of that was not gathering uh, for Thanksgiving. We had this looming fear that uh, the numbers were going to spike, but thankfully we, we did what we had to do. The community uh, really stepped up, uh, didn't gather as much, you know, hardly, uh, you can go hardly anywhere without seeing people in masks now. Um, so now we're trying to get a handle on it. But behind the hospital walls, we've never seen as many death, as much death. You know, this really is a once in a lifetime thing that we're experiencing. We're seeing healthcare workers uh, picking up extra shifts. My hospitalist partners, I can tell you almost every day there's a call out for somebody to work extra shifts um, to, to really uh, handle the numbers. Um, we have have our resident physicians that are picking up steam and, and doing their part contributing. Our ICUs have been full. We've actually increased the capacity of our ICUs, meaning we made other beds in the hospital ICU beds. We sent ICU nurses into those spaces. And our ICU guys here at Spectrum Health, they've been um, burning the candle at both ends, doing uh, their absolute best to take care of all these sick patients that they're seeing. We've never seen these many sick people, this many sick people before. Um, so it has been quite um, uh, significant, eye-opening, devastating for many. Um, I, I know I talk about numbers, but we have to remember these are people, these are our mothers, fathers, um, you know, nieces, uncles, cousins, you know, these are people that have roles in our community. And every time we lose somebody, it really has an impact, um, which is kind of what led me to speak up. Um, the more people that has the proper knowledge, um, the more we can do with making better decisions so more people can be safe from this terrible disease. Wow, that is a lot to kind of comprehend, you know, having you say that and share that for many of us who are not into the day to day, it's difficult for us to really understand. I do want to acknowledge that we do have so many people, Dr. Bragg, uh, very grateful for you spreading the word. We have Robin O'Mara saying great work, Dr. Bragg. Uh, we also have uh, Bob saying, Dr. Bragg, you are appreciated. And so a lot of people happy that you are being very very vocal about this, but this is a, a really uncomfortable conversation to have. I know that some of my friends in the black and brown communities have brought this up, that um, the whole idea of making sure that they're keeping safe and that they're keeping their families safe is on a different level than what most um, who are not in those communities have to handle. Yes, it, it is a whole different amount of pressure. Um, 
when we think about one of the things that really caused this spread through the uh, communities of color is, you know, there are some cultural things. I mean, we have multi-generational households. Um, you know, we love our families. We tend to people when they're sick. And when COVID happened, we were saying, don't go around sick people, which really uh, rubbed against our cultural norms. Yeah. We gather, we celebrate together, we eat together, we laugh, you know. So to say, don't hang out with your family, you know, that had a significant impact. So we're trying to learn how to stay connected um, despite all that. So we have these different things, other things, you know, uh, public pay, uh, facing professions, you know, many people of color are in um, service industry. Uh, and in the beginning, when people weren't being as vigilant with wearing masks, they were having all these exposures. So imagine the fear and trauma of possibly being exposed when you're working, trying to provide for your family. Um, it was so many different considerations there. And now as we're progressing through and um, talking about treatment, uh, the vaccine is one that I think is a heavier decision on our communities of color. Um, I there is this uh, mistrust that's out there and I'll be the first to acknowledge that it's warranted. You know, America has not treated black people well, uh, historically, um, especially when you're looking at the advancements of medicine. A lot of that has happened on the backs of slaves all the way back from colonial times, uh, even up into the 90s. So this is not distant history. Uh, distant history was more egregious. Um, the offenses were more obvious and blatant, but we've, we still were seeing things um, in, in the 90s. And then today, when we think about healthcare disparities, um, and that means black and brown people having different outcomes from common diseases and uh, it's related to some of the biases that still exist. It's related to some of the social determinants of health, like access to care, housing, the environment, where people live, um, uh, economics. You know, there's there's a uh, economic gap, um, a socioeconomic gap that's that's quite significant um, when you look at our communities of color, and then education and health literacy. So all these does. Uh, predisposed to bad outcomes. Uh-oh, Jennifer, are you froze? Okay. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. I think you froze on okay. my end too. Gotta love technology these days, right? <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Um, so it, no, it not only exposed us to common uh, bad outcomes from common things like diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. Now we're seeing things with COVID-19. So am I surprised? No, but now everybody is forced to look at these reasons and really get down to the root cause. So we have this mistrust, it's warranted, but how do we move forward with this new information that we have? What do we have to do to try to save more black and brown people knowing that we've been more heavily impacted by COVID-19? Well, and certainly conversations like this is the uh, key priority that we want to focus on because by having these conversations, we can answer those questions. And I appreciate people who are commenting and asking questions right now. I promise we'll get to those in just a few minutes. Uh, but first of all, I want to kind of segue to a big day for you. I mean, this is what, a week before Christmas and you got your present a little early, didn't you, Dr. Bragg? <laughs> I sure did. Uh, just this morning, I got my first uh, dose of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. You did. And let's take a look at that video right now, if we could. This is the outdoor. <laughs> Did you do it yet? <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> Thank you, Margaret. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, so did it hurt? <laughs> um, it felt like a flu shot. Uh, uh, same little pinch that you get when the needle first goes in. And then after that, um, I didn't feel anything. Uh, I don't have so uh, arm soreness. That is one of the side effects. Um, redness, tenderness at the injection site. Um, uh, some people can get fevers, chills. I, I feel fine. 
Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. You know, um, obviously, this vaccine has not been approved or licensed by the FDA, but has been authorized for emergency use by the FDA. And you recently wrote a blog that is now kind of going viral here in West Michigan in the fact that you you brought up the history that you spoke just briefly about earlier, but also with anything, you have a choice. And personal level, why did you decide that you wanted to address the fact that, yes, I am going to get the vaccine and this is something that you're not just doing for yourself, but really for the safety of those that you come across? Absolutely. Well, um, as a physician, I'm seeing many people and, you know, we like to hope that, you know, all the other things are 100 um, percent. But it's, it's just not, you know, so I want to be able to protect my patients. I want to stay well and stay a part of the healthcare team so that um, me being out of the workforce, you know, I can't afford to lose another, uh, you know, healthcare provider in this day and age. But more personally, you know, I thought about my family. I thought about the loss that we had. Um, I, I thought about how heart wrenching to have to watch a double funeral for our grandparents virtually. Um, you know, I, I thought about my sister being in the ICU and my brother now having cardiomyopathy or a weak heart, you know, after his long bout with COVID-19. Um, you know, I think about those things. I think about my parents. Um, you know, I think about the desire to want to gather again. Um, I think about how many people we've lost. I mean, life is so different. You know, if you really just sat and thought about it, um, thought about the names, called them in your head, you know, it's, it's devastating. So to me, I really needed to signify that there is hope and there's a possibility to move forward. And this really felt like the light at the end of the tunnel to me. And, and Dr. Bragg, you know, when we have community members who are asking questions and getting that knowledge that you spoke about earlier, where can they go? There's so much out there on social media platforms or conversations from people that may not have the background or expertise to provide the right answers. Uh, we're very fortunate here in S Spectrum Health to be able to provide an outlet for people to get that information, right? Where can they right. turn to? Um, so first I want to say social media is kind of our blessing and our curse. Um, just how you can find a lot of wonderful resources and reputable things. You can also find a lot of conspiracy theories. And if you end up hanging in the same social circles, uh, it's easy to make that information believable. So I would say definitely do your own research. Uh, federal agencies, CDC, um, your local healthcare um, organization, Spectrum Health has a wonderful COVID-19 uh, informational page. If you just go to spectrumhealth.org, there's a little towel that says COVID-19. There's yeah, even scrolling on the bottom of our screen oh, right oh, now too. So oh. if people want to drop that down and uh, make note of that, keep it handy as you know things progress and we want to learn information, great resource right there, Dr. Bragg. Yeah. I also love the Kent County Health Department. Um, they have a wonderful dashboard. Uh, if you go to accesskent.com, you can see what the numbers are doing in your own zip code. Um, you can look at all the different counts and go through that. Um, and that can give you an idea, idea of how prevalent the disease is in our community and how are we doing with it um, as, a, as a larger group of people. Um, yeah, so it's, it's great to, don't forget your primary care doctor. I was going to say, asking your doctor, um, yeah. Absolutely ask your doctor because all of this information, you have to put it in the context of you. We yeah. are all unique individuals with different um, histories and, and medical issues. So, you know, even the advice that you hear me given, uh, this is not to be direct medical advice. This is meant to be a talking point for you to engage with your uh, primary care physician. All right. Dr. Bragg, thank you so much. I know that you have a busy day ahead. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that many of the people who are tuning in are thanking you and um, really appreciate you using your voice, acknowledging the mistrust, the history, and also providing people hope. 
So as we close out this chat, we hope that many of you will continue to use Spectrum Health as a resource. Just uh, looking down below again, there's the website we want to give out to you. And share this post if you can to your own circles as we continue this conversation and continue to stay healthy and stay safe. Dr. Bragg, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me.